All right, welcome everyone to tonight's evening sessions. Um, my name is Kirsten Wellness, and I'm here at the Allison Jack Burt Library. And we are here tonight to enjoy evening sessions. If you're not familiar, it is a monthly program series featuring a fun and engaging mix of presentations, lectures, workshops, demonstrations, author visits, and performances on topics covering the arts, culture, history, science, and more. Um, the next ones that we will have will be on Wednesday, October 7th at 7 p.m. You can see Al Bryant present on the Titanic, The Sinking and the Aftermath. And then on Wednesday, October 21st, we will have author Nicole Beauchamp and she'll be talking about her book, Haunted Bay City, Michigan. So we hope you can join in for those either by registering on our event calendar to get the Zoom link or live on Facebook. If you haven't already, we do have a monthly newsletter that you can pick up at any of the branches or you can access on our website or you could have it mailed to you or emailed to you. And that has all of the different programs that we have. It's normally a two month newsletter, but it will be monthly through the end of the year. And something I wanted to point out to everyone is our promotion commotion, which is in celebration of National Library Card Sign Up Month. So for the month of September, if you show your library card at different businesses throughout the county, they have some different deals and discounts that they're offering. You can get more information on that on our website, or you can come in and pick up the flyer at one of our branches as well. Well, I am very excited to introduce our presenters tonight. Here with the MSU Extension, we have Lori Messing. She has been with MSU Extension for 20 years. She works with consumers in the Thumb area of Michigan, programming in the Food Safety area and the SNAPT program. We also have Lisa Triber, and she has been with MSU Extension for 22 years. She works with consumers in the Mid-Michigan area, providing programs related to food safety. Lori and Lisa will be introducing you tonight to several methods of canning and the rules of salsa. They'll provide follow-up materials to you after the program via email if you wish. They will have their email on one of the slides so you can reach out to them and have that sent to you. And also if you should have any other questions after the program, you can email. And then throughout the program, if you do have questions, feel free to put them in the chat here on Zoom or if you're joining us live on Facebook, you can put it in the comments there and we will make sure your questions get answered. So I will turn it over now to our presenters, Lori and Lisa, thank you. All right, well, thanks so much and welcome everyone. Welcome to this MSU Extension um, program in partnership with the Bay County Library System. So we're happy you can join us this evening and we're gonna start off. Um, and we wanna start off by sharing um, a really great resource that we really hope that you, if, if nothing else out of this whole presentation, I know there'll be lots you're gonna gain from it, but if nothing else, I would encourage you to put this phone number right into your phone. This is our food safety hotline. And this is a resource for you to access um, five days a week, Monday through Friday, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And this gives you the opportunity to have a source and have a you know expert right at the at your fingertips, right at the other end of your phone, to call with any types of questions you might have, whether it be about home food preservation, like we're going to talk tonight, whether it's about expiration dates, food storage, handling foods after a power outage. I mean, the list goes on and on as far as questions we receive. But I would encourage you to put that number right in your phone. Um, it's a great resource um, and you can call and get your questions answered um, five days a week at our food safety hotline. So call 877-643-9882. We're gonna move on to our presentation this evening, um, an introduction to food preservation and the rules of salsa. Um, so before we get started, for those of you that are on Zoom or on Facebook, um, we'd like to ask you a question that you could um, put an answer in the chat function um, and tell us kind of a little bit about you. Um, it is kind of nice even in a virtual class like this to know a little bit about our audience. So we'd like to know how long you've been preserving food at home. Have you been preserving zero to five years, five to 10 years, 
10 to 15 years, maybe 15 to 20. Maybe you're a seasoned home food preserver, been doing it for over 20 years, or are you brand new? We have a lot of um, brand new um, home food preservers taking classes with us this summer. Um, so type your response in the chat box if you don't mind. We'll just take um, 10, 20 seconds here and kind of see what we've got as far as our participants. So, so far I'm seeing someone who's been doing it five to 10. Oh, we've got someone brand new, wonderful. Zero to five, zero to five. Okay, so kind of a nice mix. And we often see that someone said about two years. So we'll throw you in the zero to five category there. Great, are we getting any feedback on Facebook as far as how long they've been preserving? Yeah. We got a couple brand new people and a couple zero to fives. Okay. All right. Well, it looks like then the, the majority of this evening that we've heard from are brand new and less than five years, brand new or less than five years. And again, that's been pretty common this year. We've seen quite a big um, influx in new home food preservers. Um, do we believe to the pandemic, to the stay home orders, maybe, maybe people had time to plant gardens and want to preserve more of their own food for a, a food, a safe food supply. Um, so we're happy to have you. And I think that whether you're brand new or you've been preserving for two years or five years or 10 years, um, I think you're going to um, get a few good tips and reminders this evening. All right, so let's head into our next slide. Um, and again, tonight, introduction to food preservation and the rules of salsa. We want to start off on the next slide by reminding you that good food safety practices are absolutely critical whenever we're doing anything in the kitchen. So whether we're just preparing dinner for our family, whether we're making um, food to take to a, a family outing, um, whether we're getting ready to start preserving, we're going to start canning tomatoes, let's say. Um, we want to start with that clean kitchen, cleaned and sanitized countertops, sinks, utensils, surface areas, start with clean hands, proper hand washing of minimum of 20 seconds. We know that clean hands and clean kitchens will help um, ensure a safe product. Um, after you do all this work to make a wonderful canned product, we wanna make sure it's safe for you and your family to consume. So start off with everything clean. That includes anyone who might help you. Um, last time I canned some tomato juice, you know, my 10 year old wanted to help which is fine, but he's not the best at washing his hands. So, you know, we got to get in there and get those hands clean before you're going to come in the kitchen and start preparing food. So make sure everybody's got clean hands, clean kitchen, and then you're ready to go. After you have prepared your kitchen and your hands, we want to start off by sharing some remind recommendations for some canning utensils that you might find helpful as you get ready to do some home food canning. So we've got four pictures on the screen that you should be seeing. And um, on the very far left um, is a magnet. Um, it can also be used as a bubble freer. So this bubble freer is long and slender. Um, right here, it's a lime green color, but we've seen them in various colors um, depending on where you purchase them. One end has a magnet, which is really helpful for picking up your canning lids. And the other end is rounded to help remove bubbles. And we'll talk later about the process of removing bubbles from your jars before you put your lids on. The next picture, um, if we're moving to the right side of your screen, second picture, is another example of a bubble freer. Now this bubble freer looks like a long wand. So again, one end is curved that it can remove bubbles. The other end looks like a series of steps. The steps are the distance needed to determine how far from the food the rim of the jar is. This is what we call headspace. And we'll talk a little later about how important headspace is when we're getting ready to close our jars and start them with, with processing. So you might need a quarter inch headspace or a half inch or up to an inch. And we're going to talk about the importance of that. But having a tool like this can be helpful in allowing you to measure headspace. That third picture is a funnel, probably something you've all seen. Um, it is a really helpful tool though when it comes to filling jars. It can really cut down on the mess and help you um, keep those jars getting fuller, easier, faster with less mess. And the fourth picture on the very far right is a jar lifter. 
And this is a really great tool to help you when you are gonna be loading your jars into and out of your canner, whether it's a water bath canner or a pressure canner. Um, it's really nice to have that jar lifter help you get the jars in and out. So that way, especially at the end of processing when they are very, very hot, you know, you don't accidentally come in contact with the lid when you're trying to lift them out and impact the potential for them to seal. So some canning utensils that can be very helpful. Um, definitely you can you know, do without or make do without some of these, but if you have the opportunity, these might be some things to keep in mind, especially if you plan on canning you know, for many years, um, they can be really good investments and they're not very expensive tools to use and to purchase. The jar lifter really probably is one of my favorites because it just makes things much easier. All right, we're gonna move into the next slide and talk a little bit about high acid foods. Um, as we talk through the evening, you're gonna learn about different types of foods, how you, you need to can each of those different types of food to make sure you have a safe product because there are recommendations um, for high acid versus low acid foods. And we're gonna start with high acid. So high acid foods have a pH of zero to about 4.6. When you are canning food at home, one important factor to consider is what type of canner can be used for each type of food. So with high acid foods, these can be safely processed in a water bath or an atmospheric steam canner. And we'll see each of those in a minute. Examples of high acid foods are almost all fruits, tomatoes and figs, which have been acidified, sauerkraut and pickled foods. So those are high acid foods that you can preserve in your water bath or your atmospheric steam canner. Um, the next slide will get into a little bit about what those different types of equipment look like. And so if we take a peek here on your screen, you will see on the left is a picture of an atmospheric steam canner. And on the right is a picture of a water bath canner. So there are differences between these canners. They can both be used for high acid foods, like we just said, but they do work a little bit differently. Um, both are fine, both are acceptable. And what we're finding um, as we talk to people, including our, our team members, as well as consumers, um, we're finding it really comes down to a personal preference, what you choose to use um, for canning your high acid foods, or maybe it's just what you have you know, in your house to can with. Um, Lisa, who's gonna speak with us tonight, she has an atmospheric steam canner, which she uses, it uses and really enjoys. I myself um, don't have one of those, so um, I use the water bath canner. They both work just fine as long as you're following the research-based recommendations and, and the steps for each one. A few differences though for you to keep in mind if you're looking to purchase one, um, one versus the other. One thing to know is that you do use substantially more water in that water bath canner. You know, you have to have enough water in the water bath canner so that there's an inch or two of water above the jars. So if you're doing quart jars, as you can imagine, picturing that quart jar, you know, you still have to have another inch or two of water above it. So it does take quite a bit of water. Pints, not as much, but quarts quite a bit. Um, another thing to know um, about that is, so the steam canner uses less water, it is lighter, um, one other variable though is depending on what you're going to process for your high acid food, the processing time must be less than 45 minutes for you to use your atmospheric steam canner. So if you're making jams and jellies, no problem. Those you'll usually only process five to 10 minutes um, or a little more depending on which recipe you're using. But let's say you were doing um, an item and they had to be water bathed for 80 minutes. You would not have the option to use your atmospheric steam canner because it's over 45 minutes. You would have to use your water bath canner for that um, product example. So again, there are some differences. Both are acceptable for high acid foods, but you do need to keep in mind um, how to properly use each one of those. And so on the next slide, we'll talk just a bit more about the water bath canner itself. Um, with your water bath. Lori? Oh, yeah. Lori, there was a question on Facebook. They want to know, can an Instant Pot be used as a water bath canner? Well, we knew that question would be addressed tonight. We've gotten that question all summer long, haven't we, Lisa? And um, we will address that later, but I can just briefly for now say that no. 
Well, well, actually, for a water bath canner, if you were going to strip, could you? Was the question can they use it as a water bath canner or to can? What was the question? Um, can an instant pot be used as a water bath canner? As a water bath canner. So, with an instant pot, um, with any type of pot. You can make uh, just a regular stock pot or any sort of pot in your kitchen a water bath canner if you do a couple things. The first one is um, there has to be a rack of some sort or some mechanism to keep the jars off the bottom. You can't have jars touching the bottom of the pot that can lead to breakage and cracking. Um, the other thing is, like we said, um, oh no, the Instapot's not going to... Help me out, Lisa. The Instant Pot, you're not going to just be able to boil the water. No, so... <clears throat> no, you're not going to be able to do that with an no, Instant Pot. No, the jars have to be totally submerged to be water bath canned. Yeah. Um, and so, no, I don't believe the Instant Pot is going to work as a water bath canner or an atmospheric steam canner, which Lori's going to elaborate on in the next slide. Yeah. So the Instant Pot is not designed to can food, period. <laughs> Yeah. And we'll continue to give you reasons as to why throughout the presentation. Yeah, but they brought up a, a good point about using a pot besides a water bath canner. Maybe you don't have the actual specific water bath canner you can purchase. So if you have a stock pot, you can put on your stove and you can have a rack on the bottom. Even if you make the rack out of your canning rings and, and twist tie them together so the jars stay off the bottom. Again, as long as you have one to two inches of water above your jars, you could use your tall stock pot. Um, but you, like Lisa said, um, that Instapot's not going to be able to do that for water bath canning. And we'll see later, it's not recommended for canning at all, like Lisa said. Um, so it's, it's a great question and we've gotten that question. I bet every session we've done all summer long, and I think Lisa would agree, we've heard that question because they are very popular products, um, but unfortunately they're not designed for um, home food canning um, using USDA um, approved um, recommendations, which is what we promote and encourage all of you to use. And Lori, I'll, I'll take that one step further. Um, we're using the brand name Instapot, but any electric pressure cooker is, is not designed to can at this time. Great. Yep. Thanks for clarifying. You're right. Yeah. It's just a brand name, but any of those types of devices, we would not recommend. So a great question out there. Um, so remember with your water bath canner, the canner has to be about half full of water. Um, you need to have the water um, already simmering um, for a raw pack about 140 degrees. And if you're doing a hot pack food, about 180 degrees. And then once you have your jars full and filled, you place the filled canning jars on that rack in the canner. And you can see on the picture there that if you purchase an actual water bath canner, it comes with that rack, that wire rack, which enables you to keep the jars off the bottom of the, the pot. Um, the water must cover the jars by at least one to two inches. So once you lower those jars into the water, we've got to make sure there's enough water over top. So we do recommend in a lot of cases you have some water boiling separately in another pot on the stove just in case you don't have quite enough water in there. And that way you can add additional water. Um, then you wanna place the lid on the canner. And then once the water starts boiling is when you start timing. So if you're supposed to water bath, can your tomatoes for 40 minutes, let's say, um, you don't start timing until that water comes back to a full rolling boil and then start your 40 minute timer. Um, that's, some, that's a mistake some people make sometimes is they start the timing as soon as they lower the jars into the water. And that's not going to give you a properly processed product. You have to wait for that water to start boiling again. Okay, so keep that in mind as well. Um, like we said, you could make your own if necessary, if you have the right size pot for the jars you're going to be using. The atmospheric steam canner um, works a little bit different, and there's a nice picture to show you what it looks like as well as the gauge. The atmospheric steam canner has a large dome, a short pan for water, and a rack to keep the jars above the water. You will only use about two and a half quarts of water with this canner. 
There's also a steam hole for determining the temperature inside the canner using a thermometer. On top of the dome is an indicator to assist in determining the steam processing. Again, only high acid foods with less than 45 minutes of processing time can be done in this canner. So examples might be jams or jellies, uh, most fruits and fruit sauces, cucumber pickles, fruit pickles, relishes, some tomatoes, and fruit salsas. Remember though, some tomato products do require longer than 45 minutes of processing. So those would have to be done in your water bath canner or in a pressure canner instead. So it's really important to read your research-based recipe, look at that processing time to see if you can use your steam canner. Okay, and only high acid foods. We're never going to use our steam canner or water bath canner to process vegetables or meats. Those are considered low acid foods. So as we said, we, we kind of expected this question about electric canners to come up. And here's a picture of one. Um, so this electric water bath canner has a rack to keep jars off the bottom. It's an excellent option if there's limited stove space. Um, or if you have a glass cook surface. Some manufacturers of glass cooking surfaces do warn consumers not to can on that glass surface. So please check with your manufacturer before you attempt to do any canning on your glass top stove. The heat and pressure on the glass top stove could cause the surface to crack and break. The electric canner needs to be tall enough for four quart jars to stand upright, to stand vertical, plus enough space for at least one inch of water above them for an even heat distribution. This unit will process just like a water bath canner so the water, boiling water will circulate around the jars while processing. All right, so those are the tricks with our high acid foods. Now let's move into some low acid foods and give you some recommendations on those. So low acid foods have a pH greater than or equal to 4.6. So think about things like vegetables, meats, poultry, seafood, soups and mixtures, a mixture of a low acid and a high acid would have to be pressure canned as well. These foods all must be pressure canned. And if we could do it, we would put must in big bold letters and underline it and, you know, they must be canned with a pressure canner to be safe to eat, period. You do not have the option to choose how to can them. They must be pressure canned. Or if you don't have a pressure canner, don't like the pressure canner, you can freeze them, no problem but we cannot water bath or steam can low acid foods. We have to pressure can them for safety. And the reason on the next slide for that is because of botulism. Botulism is a rare but deadly illness caused by a poison most commonly produ produced by a germ called Clostridium botulinum. The germ is found in the soil and can survive and grow and produce a toxin in certain conditions like when food is improperly canned. The toxin can affect your nerves, cause paralysis, and it has caused people to die. You can't see, smell, or taste it, and so that makes it even trickier. So we have to make sure we are properly um, canning foods and to ensure the risk of botulism is not gonna occur. Many cases of botulism have happened after people consumed home canned or preserved foods that were contaminated and they were not canned and processed correctly. So we don't wanna scare you, but we want you to realize that when, when we talk about pressure canning, it is a very serious um, process and we need to you know, take it seriously as far as how we preserve our vegetables and our meats. You know, we have to pressure can them to be safe. All right. Let's talk for a minute about altitude, about elevation. As altitude and the elevation increases, the temperature at which water boils decreases. So more pressure must be applied to obtain the desired temperature. So um, those of you joining us in Michigan here, um, you know, most places in Michigan are in the zero to 1,000 feet altitude. There are some areas, pockets around the state that are um, higher um, elevation. So you'll want to research that 
and follow your research-based recommendations to adjust your altitude and make sure you are preserving and, and processing at the right altitude. Let's talk for a minute about pressure canning. And again, this, this is just really brief as we're going through here. You, um, you know, we have cl whole classes dedicated to these topics individually. So if it is seeming kind of fast and overwhelming, um, you know, unfortunately, there is quite a bit of information that we won't have time to get into tonight. Um, but Lisa will share some resources with you at the end as well. So two types of pressure canners are the weighted gauge and the dial gauge. Um, all pressure canners have a bottom rack, just like with water bath and steam canners, we do not want jars sitting on the bottom of the pot. Pressure regulators or indicators like dial or weighted gauges, vent pipes, or petcocks for pressurizing, safety valves, um, flexible gaskets, there's safety locks. So again, these pressure canners are a little more complex than the water bath canner. Um, and we'll go through those in depth. Well, not in depth, but we'll um, overview these here in the next two slides for you. So you may have a dial gauge pressure canner. A dial gauge pressure canner is just like it sounds. It has a dial with numbers designating five to 15 pounds of pressure with increments in between. The lid twists to lock in place. This particular pressure canner has a vent pipe to exhaust the canner and create a vacuum. Once the canner has been exhausted for 10 minutes, the weight is put on the vent pipe to close the canner and allow the pressure to begin to build. Um, there are safety valves with the canners as well. So if any of you have heard stories of family or friends in the past that have had issues with their pressure canners or pressure canners um, exploding, um, they do have a lot of safety features in place now. And if you follow the process through step by step, they're completely safe to use. You know, we often encourage people when you're canning anything, but especially when you're dealing with a pressure canner, you know, don't be trying to multitask and do many things at once and kind of forget about your pressure canner. You know, that's when things can start to change quickly if you are not keeping your eye on it and monitoring it at all times for safety. Now, some of you may have a weighted gauge pressure canner. Um, and again, this is a personal preference. Um, I prefer the dial gauge. I like to see the numbers. We have one person, Karen, on our team who loves her weighted gauge. So um, again, some of it's a personal preference. The weighted gauge is a little different. You'll see there's no dial with numbers, but there's weights that um, get slipped onto the top of the lid and the weight will either make a gentle rocking sound or a burst of jiggling to indicate the pressure is being maintained. And then you just have to monitor that rocking and jiggling. And you'll have to read the manufacturer's directions to make sure you're doing it properly but that weight controls the amount of pressure building in the canner. Um, so again, a little bit different, but it's doing the same thing inside the canner. It's really just a matter of how you prefer to monitor your canner, watching a dial with numbers or watching that weight on the top of the canner. When it comes to pressure canner processing, no matter what type of canner you're using for pressure canning, you only start with a couple inches of water, two or three, um, you're gonna, depending on if you're doing a hot pack or a raw pack, you're gonna watch your water temperatures from 140 to 180. After your jars have been filled, let's say it's corn, because we would always pressure can corn at the vegetable. Place your jars of corn on the rack in the canner and then put the lid on the canner with the weight off. Now remember, again, the pressure canner lid locks into place. We don't just sit it on top like we would our water bath. We're gonna twist it and lock it into place. The next step is really important. You need to exhaust all the steam out of your canner and let it exhaust for 10 full minutes. And you should time it, get the timer out and set it for 10 minutes. The steam must flow freely um, because what you're doing is evening out all the pressure inside there. Wait until there's a constant strong funnel of steam and then do your 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, place the weight on to start pressurizing the canner. This will even out the pressure inside. Um, and then after you have done that, you can watch the pressure start to build. So let's say we're gonna pressure can at, you know, 11 pounds of pressure or 10, let's say 11, 11 pounds of pressure. So you wanna watch that dial gauge till it gets to 11 pounds. 
And if we were supposed to walk, um, pressure can at 11 pounds of pressure for 30 minutes, let's say, once it hits 11 pounds and, and stays there, start your timer for 30 minutes. The trick with your pressure canner though, is it has to stay at 11 pounds of pressure. If for some reason it starts to drop, then you need to start timing all over again. So you really, again, have to pay attention. You have to be monitoring that pressure canner, watching the dial gauge, or if you have the weighted gauge, maintaining and monitoring that jiggling for your weighted gauge. Otherwise, if it drops, you're gonna start all over with your timing. Um, once you're done with your 30 minutes of processing, turn off the heat, let the pressure drop down to zero degrees on your dial gauge, then wait another minute or two to make sure all the pressure is gone. Um, after that, remove the weight, wait 10 more minutes before you open the canner. It's a slow process and you have to take it step by step. Then you can remove your jars. Um, with your weighted gauge though, it's a little bit different and you need to wait about 30 to 45 minutes. Um, after processing is done, before you remove the weight. And at that point, you can unfasten the lid, open it, and then leave the jars in the canner for 10 more minutes before lifting your jars out. So again, it, it takes some time, okay? We want you to realize that. And on the next slide, there's a, a little visual kind of walkthrough of each of those steps. Um, to help you understand and kind of get an idea of it. But again, well, we have some resources we can get you after the presentation because it is a lot of information right now. And we, we totally understand that. Um, the next slide reminds us about a pressure canner versus a pressure cooker. And so we kind of just talked about this with that question earlier. Um, we cannot recommend using these electric multi cookers for pressure canning, unfortunately. At this point, we can't do that. There's issues related to how the thermal processing works. There's issues related to the temperatures inside. Um, in order to ensure the safety of a final product, the temperature in the canner must stay at a minimum um, number throughout the processing time. And at this point, again, we don't have enough information to recommend these. One of the biggest concerns also is that the USDA low acid pressure process times rely on a combination of heat from the time the canner comes to pressure um, to during the actual process time and then during the early stages of the cooling of the jars and the canner. And so again, we just at this point, we can't recommend you use those. We would, would definitely um, encourage you not to try and use those um, stick with your water bath canner, your atmospheric steam canner, or your um, pressure canner. Okay, so I'm going to now turn it over to Lisa and let her move us through the rest of the introduction and into some salsa tips. Thank you, Lori. Um, I was <laughs> sorry if I fell behind on your slides. I was trying to um, answer a couple questions while we were going. Um, <clears throat> One of the questions we had, um, they wanted to know if they were doing dilly beans, if they had to pressure can them. And I did answer that for them and said, um, just for the sake of others, I'm sharing this with everyone. Um, dilly beans are actually acidified. Um, they're in a vinegar brine. Uh, so no, you do not have to pressure can dilly beans. They would be um, water bath canned. So that is um, one of the nice things when you pickle. Um, if you did a corn relish, that corn relish would be in a vinegar brine and it would not have to be um, acidified either. And um, Kirsten and Emily, I'm not, <laughs> I can't get the questions to come up again. Is there anything else that we need to answer right now before we move forward? Yep, there was another question from Facebook where they, said at the water bath stage, they had a batch of quart jars of tomatoes in and the water didn't completely cover the jars. It was between two thirds to the top and they boiled them for four minutes, pre-cooked them in a pot. She heard you say 40 minutes and I'm questioning if it was, or four minutes was not enough. And also, will they be okay even though the water wasn't over the top? So she brings up a really couple interesting questions. Um, first of all, depending on how the tomatoes were prepared, um, 
they have different processing times. Um, if you've cooked the tomatoes and they're crushed, they would have a shorter processing time. If the tomatoes are halved or whole, um, they would have a different processing time. And I, I don't have all of my stuff here in front of me right now. And I, I don't like to give partial recipes through a presentation. Um, I, when we get to the resources um, tonight and the document that I can send to people if they want me to send them some additional information, um, that is going to give you the full information. If you put cold tomatoes in a jar um, and then put hot liquid over them, that is going to have a different processing time. So there are probably a half a dozen different ways that tomatoes can be processed and the time will give them, um, will vary depending on how you repack them, if you will. So, but getting back to the question, the other part of the question, if the water doesn't cover the jars and circulate all around the jars, that is a problem. Um, that doesn't give that full heat penetration um, for processing and, and that is an issue. So, um, you know, the next question we would ask is, is if she did those jars within 24 hours, she could reprocess them. And if it's been more than 24 hours, Lori, I think you'd probably agree with me, they're probably not going to be safe. Yeah, we can't verify that if the process wasn't followed properly, unfortunately, um, we, we would not recommend that. No. So, um, and we can, you know, either talk a little bit more when we get through with this presentation or again, um, encourage you to call the hotline um, to get some more detailed information as well. But because I know our time is ticking here tonight and we want to get through everything. So we want to spend a couple minutes talking about canning jars and canning lids. Um, it is recommended to only use standard commercial uh, mason type canning jars. Now that mason is sometimes a confusing word because people will come to us and say, I saw that word mason on my spaghetti sauce jar, so does that mean I can use it? Well, no. <laughs> um, what a uh, pasta company or a pasta sauce company uses is different than what we would want you to use for a canning jar. We being, we speak for the USDA, um, a canning jar is going to have a flat rim. So that lid with the compound on it is going to seal tightly. And um, <clears throat> the word mason actually uh, refers to the patent on the neck of the jar. So it, it actually doesn't make it mean it's safe to be a canning jar. So we want canning jars that are, are manufactured by reputable canning companies. Um, Golden Harvest, Ball, Kerr, any of those would be considered a, a canning jar. And these jars are tempered to withstand temperatures um, in moist heat. And that is another issue that we've had a lot of questions on this summer. People want to put their canning jars in the oven to heat them or to process with them. And um, again, that is not something that's recommended by the USDA. The dry heat can cause the glass to shatter, um, actually blow up with food in it or without food in it. So we do not encourage people to do any kind of dry heat with those canning jars. Um, the jars are not intended to be, um, the, the spaghetti jars, the mayonnaise jars, things like that, are not intended to be reused for home canning, even though um, I know that my mom and my grandma did that. <laughs> um, but there is potential for them to break. Um, and we don't want to put all that work into filling them and then have them break at this point. You want to check your jars for chips, cracks, nicks. Um, run your finger around the rim of the jar and make sure that it feels smooth. Um, that can cause a problem with something not sealing properly. Um, and then just handle those jars carefully. Don't be clanking them together. Um, keep them in a cool, dark, dry environment once they're emptied and don't put them outside in a garage where there's extreme temperature change. Um, and then we have this big dilemma that we're going through right now with the lid shortage. Um, canning lids, 
what's recommended by the USDA are the two-piece lid and ring like you see on the bottom picture here. Um, the two-piece lid and ring is what um, we get a, a good seal with. It's what is um, recommended from all the research tested recipes. And um, oh boy, I know they're super hard to find right now. So just um, be very careful. They do last, the, the lids are good for five years if you keep them in a cool, dry place. Um, again, not exposing them to extreme heat and things like that. And then one last thing to comment on with the jars. Um, your recipe, I just did jam today. Um, my recipe said I could put it in half pint jars. Um, I can go smaller, but I can't go bigger. So if you're making salsa or you're doing tomatoes or a relish, and it says you can put it in a pint jar, and you're thinking, oh, I could get this over with faster and put it in a quart jar. You can't do that. You can go smaller, but you can't go bigger. And you still have to process it for that um, time um, that it tells you for whatever size jar the recipe told you to do. So never adjust your times or your um, um, go to a bigger jar, okay? All right. Um, getting jars ready. They should be washed just like the rings and the lids in hot soapy water. And then um, every recipe is going to tell you to fill your jars um, um, that are hot. So they've been simmered in a, in a canner as we see in the picture on the right hand side. If a, if a recipe is um, going to have a shorter processing time like a jam or a jelly, there will be directions on there for you to sterilize that jar. And that is simply done by boiling it in water for 10 minutes. Do not rely on a dishwasher to sterilize your jars. Um, they will not get up to a hot enough temperature. You, it's perfectly fine to use your dishwasher to heat your jars, um, but don't rely on them to sterilize. And then the, um, this... Lisa, yeah. someone had a quick question here about the lids. Lids are good for five years to reuse or to store on the no, food? No, 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 to, to store them. Yeah, we never want to reuse lids. Um, that rubber compound that's on the inside of the lid um, is almost like a memory. It makes an indentation when we, when we seal the jar. And um, there's a good chance when you, if you would use it again, that you may not get as good of a seal the next time. So uh, lids should not be reused. And then you'll also notice in that last slide that I just showed you, um, the lids were being washed in hot soapy water. And that is kind of the current recommendation now. There is no need, um, if you're using one particular brand, read the directions on the box, but there is um, <clears throat> no recommendation anymore for um, simmering the lids or heating them. They never should have been boiled ever, um, but there's no recommendation for um, simmering them anymore. All they needed to be done is washed in hot soapy water, rinsed, and then leave them laying on your, your towel as you're filling the jars and you're ready to go. So um, after you've prepared your produce, according to your research tested recipe, it's time to fill the jars. And when we saw that equipment in the beginning slide, um, that wide mouth funnel, that Lori said she liked the jar lifter. I like the jar lifter, but I also like a wide mouth funnel. It saves a lot of stuff from slopping over the edge of the jars. Um, it comes in very handy. And we can see in um, two of the pictures here, um, in the first picture on the left, we are putting a, um, a peach jam into the first jar. And in the second picture, we're putting a um, tomato sauce into the, into the jars. Um, oh, and then in the third picture, we have applesauce. And it just works so nice to have that funnel to get that food into the jar um, rather than trying to have it slop onto the towels. You'll see um, we have a, a blue um, on the far right-hand picture. Um, burper or wand that you can weave through the food to make sure there's no air bubbles. And it's very important to get those air bubbles out. Um, that could be a cold spot that's left in the jars, so you want to weave through that. 
um, pasta sauce or tomato sauce in the middle picture, there's not going to be too many air bubbles in there because it's pretty much all liquid. Um, the peach jam, we would do the same thing. We would swish that um, bubble wand through there and make sure that there were no little pockets of air. The next slide, we're measuring for headspace. And every recipe is going to tell you to leave a quarter inch headspace, half inch headspace, inch and a half headspace. It just depends on what that food item is that you're putting in the jars. If you leave too much headspace, um, there's potential for the food to discolor and um, there might be too much air left in the jar and you may not get a, a good seal. If you leave um, not enough headspace, the food could bubble out and again the jar may not seal because it was so full that as it was processing it kind of oozed out and then it left residue on the rim of the jar. So that measuring that headspace, there is a method to the madness as to why you do that. Um, so it is important to do. So once we have the food in the jar, we've checked the headspace. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take just a damp paper towel, like we see in the picture on the left here, and we're gonna wipe the rim of the jar. And again, um, this is important because we want that lid to adhere as it's processing. So by doing this, we're making sure that there's no um, liquid, there's no seeds, um, anything that could interfere with the lid sealing. And then <clears throat> the, the next picture is um, just a little demonstration of putting the ring on. And it's, it's, the term is fingertip tight. And if you wrench it on too hard, there's potential for that lid to buckle. Um, if you leave it too lit, loose, the lid might not seal. So it's, it's you know, if you're really strong, um, you don't want to put all your muscle into it as you're putting that ring on. So it's just a gentle twist when it starts to, to catch. Um, that's about it. That's all you need to do. Now you may take those jars out of the canner and those rings may be loose. Um, just leave them. Don't tighten them down when you take them out of the canner. Just let them be. Um, and the, the lids will seal. It'll be okay. So we have um, given you a very quick overview of canners, of filling jars, and we're gonna spend the rest of our time, which isn't much, talking about salsa. And um, the first concept we wanna get through to you um, is, um, well, we wanna ask you a question first, and you can answer really quickly in the chat box again. True or false? I can preserve any salsa recipe and it will be safe. What do you think? True or false on that one? So just take a couple seconds because I don't want to spend too much time on this one. <laughs> and um, so we've got one person that jumped in right away and said false. Anybody else want to take a stab at that in the chat box? We got anybody on Facebook? Oh, we got question marks. They're waiting for me to give the answer. We have two false on Facebook. Okay. All right. Well, our false answers are correct. Um, and we're going to go through the rules of salsa in just a minute here. But the, the answer on this or the wording on the slide kind of gives it away. When you cook, you can be as creative and as artistic as you want. But when you preserve, it's a science. And you have to be very careful about what you're putting in the jars and following research tested recipes. Um, this is where if you have the most fabulous salsa in the world, um, you may not be able to can it. So this is where you're gonna have to be very careful. So let's look through the rules of salsa. First rule is, is you wanna use high quality produce. You want to make sure your tomatoes, your peppers, your onions, and your garlic are ripe. They're not starting to turn. Um, they're not overripe, or the tomatoes are suffering from blight or frost damage. Our next rule is, speaking just specifically about tomatoes, is you can mix and match your tomatoes. 
You can use red tomatoes, green tomatoes. You can use heirloom tomatoes. If you have tomatillos, you can use those as long as you're using the exact amount that the recipe calls for and you keep it in the same proportion. So you wanna measure after you've removed the peels and you've cored and chopped your tomatoes. So if it calls for you know, seven cups, nine cups, you get your tomatoes prepped and then you measure. When we talk about peppers, oh boy, um, this one you wanna use the amount of peppers that the recipe calls for. Again, you can mix and match varieties. If you're one of those people that likes a really hot salsa, you can put in all the hot peppers you want. Or if you're like me, <laughs> you're kind of wimpy. Um, I put in all those nice orange and red and yellow peppers and make it really pretty. But I, I really don't like a hot salsa. I like to enjoy all the flavors. Um, but I don't want my tongue falling off because it's so hot. So, but again, you put in the exact proportions that the recipe calls for. Then you have to acidify your salsa. Fresh lemons and limes should not be used for a canned salsa recipe. It's fine to use these for fresh or frozen salsa, but not for a salsa that you're going to preserve. And this is because of issues with a stabilized pH. It's important that you use the amount and type of acid that the recipe calls for. You might have one recipe tell you to use vinegar, another one that tells you to use bottled lemon juice, and another one that talks about using lime juice. So it's very important that you stick to the acid that the recipe calls for. Um, you cannot substitute one acid product for another. And then the other thing you need to do is you need to make sure that your vinegar is 5% acidity. We've seen a lot of stores that have these beautiful canning displays um, and the vinegar is 4% acidity and you can get into trouble with that. So you wanna make sure that your vinegar is 5% acidity. Okay, dried spices. Dried spices or herbs can be added or deleted as desired. This can be salt, pepper, dried chili pepper, coriander, cumin, oregano, um, whatever you wanna put in, if it's dried, you can plus or minus it as much as you want, all right? On the next page though, adding additional fresh herbs vegetables or even beans or corn can impact the pH of your salsa. And this is where things start to get dangerous, especially when you can it. So you can't make changes to a recipe. Um, we recommend that you make the salsa recipe as it is. And then when you open that jar up, then you doctor it up with the things that you like. Um, and I, honestly, if you put fresh cilantro into a lot of these canned recipes, it's going to turn black and slimy. It looks much better chopped up fresh than it does canned. So just some things to think about that way. Thickeners. Sometimes our salsa is very watery and you're thinking, oh, I need to put something in here to make it thicker. Um, not before you can it. <laughs> Don't do it. Um, you've heard me say heat penetration tonight. If you've thickened it, um, that could be a problem for making sure it gets hot enough at the center of the jar. So again, make the salsa as is. And then when you open it and get ready to serve it, you can dice up some more fresh tomatoes. You can add a little cornstarch, a little flour, some tomato paste to thicken it up and doctor it up to how you would, you would prefer it to be. But don't thicken it before you can it. That's not safe. Um, processing and jar size. I touched on the jar size already, but just to remind you, you can go smaller if you wanted to make little gift jars, but you cannot go bigger. So remember that. And then um, the canners that you would use would be either the atmospheric steam canner or a water bath canner. I have not come across a recipe yet for pressure canning. 
Um, and a lot of times we'll get people that will say, well, I can add whatever I want, and then if I pressure can it, it will be safe. No, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. So stick with the recipes and process it the right way. And then homemade salsa recipes, and this kind of goes back to that question we, we just asked. Um, it's not safe to preserve your own original recipe. You want to look for a research tested recipe that closely matches your own recipe and make that. And then when you open your salsa up, add those extras that you feel will make your salsa taste even better. Um, if you absolutely can't find anything, we recommend freezing it. Um, and then enjoying it that way when it thaws. So that's our suggestion for that. These are those resources we've been telling you about all night. Um, if you have a phone and you want to snap a picture of it, you can do that. However, um, I am going to give you my email address. And if you want me to send you some resources via email, I will do that. And this will be one of those pages that I will send you with all of these resources on it. So um, I would be more than happy to do that. I have the rules of salsa to send you, um, our fact sheets on the three methods of canning we shared tonight, and a couple of other things that I'm, I'm happy to send to you. Um, we recommend if you use a Ball Blue Book that you're using um, the most current edition, which is, I believe, the 2016. Um, the USDA Complete Guide to Home Canning, and these are all on that resource sheet, um, where to find them. And then, of course, our Michigan Fresh fact sheet as well. So um, we would encourage you to take advantage of those resources. Here is my email address. Um, again, if you want me to send you um, information, I will send one email out with um, all the PDF documents, and then you will have those to share, or to, to you can share them too, I don't care, um, but to hang on to, so you have those. Um, but it's my last name, Triber, T-R-E-I-B-E-R, -E -E at M-S-U dot E-D-U. And then just in the subject line, um, you know, you put salsa, canning class, something, so I, I don't think I'm getting junk mail from somebody I don't know, so. But if you would do that, I will send out a batch email to everyone tomorrow. And um, also, if you're interested in other classes that we offer, I can send out a class schedule as well, if you would like to, to learn more about some of the other online classes we're doing right now. And with that, um, I think I, I did it. It's 8 o'clock. <laughs> do we have any other questions that we missed? I have not seen any others come through. If anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or on the comments on Facebook quick and we can hopefully get them answered. If not, you can always email Lisa after yes. the program as well. Yeah, I'd be happy to help you out if anybody has anything. So I not anything come through. Um, thank you everyone so much for joining tonight. We really appreciate you being here on Zoom and also live on Facebook. Um, it was wonderful. I know I learned lots of new, new things that I didn't know before. So thank you so much, um, Lisa and Lori. And um, if someone asked, will this be available later? Yep, it is being recorded and it will be up on our YouTube page, which they'll post on our Facebook page as well for those who may have missed it. So, yep, be looking for that in the next week. Um, and Kirsten, just to let everyone know, we do have food preservation classes every Thursday going on as well on lots of different topics. We know that was a lot of information to kind of throw in your heads here in one hour. So you can um, check out our website and Lisa can you know share that as well. But um, lots of opportunities if you'd like to learn more. So please join us. Yeah, well, thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, we really appreciate it. And we hope to see you again next month for our other evening sessions. Thank you. Thank you.